Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the 2023 Fly North Dakota Conference. I really appreciate all of you who are in attendance with us. I, uh, like always, the weather sometimes is a challenge in North Dakota. And, uh, but the fact that you're here in person, I really appreciate that. Hopefully you're able to stay for the rest of the conference as well. Uh, just a couple of reminders as we start out. Uh, please uh, sign in your name onto the sign-in sheet. Uh, I also want to remind everybody that uh, we are videoing uh, this session for other aerial applicators to watch online. Um, and for those of you who are watching online, please uh, rem uh, reminder for at the end of the, the video to take the, uh, the quiz uh, at the end just to ensure that uh, you get credit for watching this video. And so we have a great uh, agenda here for you today. Uh, we're going to be having uh, Rebecca Orgard from the Department of Agriculture talking about updates from their office. Uh, we have unmanned aircraft topics from Daniel Miller with the Northern Plains UAS test site. Uh, Brian Rao is going to talk about um, accidents and strategies for improvements in the aerial applicator world. And then Jeff Bowe is going to be talking about aging aircraft. And so, um, again, um, great agenda for you today. And uh, I'm going to kick things off real quick just to give you a brief update from the North Dakota Aeronautics Commission office. And uh, just another reminder about the safety requirements um, in the world of aerial application. So with the Aeronautics Commission, you are required to either attend pass or uh, watch this session on an annual basis. And so if you have gone to pass, um, you know, that, that's, that's great. That's obviously an excellent opportunity to get uh, a training in, in your world. Uh, the Department of Agriculture requires you to take pass once every three years. And so again, uh, that's their requirement from the Depart Department of Agriculture. Our office accepts, accepts that as your annual requirement, but if you did not go to pass, you do still need to uh, either attend this meeting in person or watch the video online. So a couple of reminders uh, from the Aeronautics Commission. Um, your, your aerial applicator aircraft must be registered within the state. Um, all pilots must be listed on the license. And so if you're adding pilots or aircraft throughout the year, make sure to contact the Aeronautics Commission office to ensure that those pilots or aircraft are added uh, to that license. Another reminder that the, the decal requirement, we used to require that every aerial applicator aircraft have a decal on the side of the aircraft. And so a reminder that that requirement was removed about a year ago. And so that no longer is required. We have all of the end numbers of all of the aircraft at our state office. And so we do know which aircraft around the state are licensed appropriately. And so we felt that that was uh, good enough in regards to not needing to require an actual decal being displayed. And uh, Again, feel free to contact us with any changes uh, to your license as we move forward. Uh, Janelle Peterson right here, she's our licensing specialist with our office. Just, she's been with us about a year and a half, does a great job. We're really here to help you out and really sort through any issues to make sure that you're flying legally and safely. That's really our goal at the Aeronautics Commission. And so just a couple of reminders. Uh, we do receive complaints during the summer. So whenever uh, there are issues in the air applicator world, uh, we get a call at the Aeronautics Commission. So this is just kind of a breakdown of what the process looks like. You know, we document the complaint. We determine the severity of the incident. Sometimes it's a very minute thing. They just want to make us aware of, a, of something that occurred. We just make note of it. Um, we don't necessarily need to follow up if it's not necessarily serious. If it is more serious, we do call um, and try to locate the aerial applicator that um, was responsible for that incident. We may involve the FISDO, the Sheriff's Office. It really depends on what the incident is. A lot, a lot of the times we can just take care of it with the aerial applicator because for the most part they're misunderstandings. And so we can work through those issues hopefully with the complainant and the aerial applicator company. Um, but you know we are on your side. We're trying to determine what um, you know the facts of the case actually are, uh, what the concerns are, and, um, and find out what the remedy is. And a lot of times it's really just communication. And so we really encourage our aerial applicators to communicate well. Um, obviously with the, with the landowners or the farmers in the area. Uh, we'll be honest, the main complaint we get um, from uh, residents of our state are just aerial applicators flying over houses, uh, directly over houses. And so, you know, when you're planning to, uh, to approach a field, uh, please obviously try to avoid, you know, houses or, or other people's property where you can when you're doing a lower approach. Uh, if it can't be mitigated, uh, communication. You really need to reach out to, to those individuals and work with them. And, and make sure that everybody's understanding of, of what your operation looks like and that your full intent is obviously to have safe operations, um, you know, which is the goal for everybody. You know, you as a pilot, want, 
you know, that's our, our biggest reasoning with, with the complainants is that these aerial applicators, it's their life on the line. We want, they want to make sure that they make it home to their families as well. Um, and so there's, there's always a path forward here to figure this out. But just a reminder um, that, uh, that if you get a call from us, you know, we're just trying to work through and find the facts. And, uh, and hopefully, um, you know, this season is a good one. We get less calls. That's what we're always hoping for. Another update on, uh, on uh, the UAS air applicator license. About a year ago, we went through the administrative rule process uh, to update uh, our administrative code. And we now allow the licensing of unmanned aircraft um, for air application in the state of North Dakota. I believe now we have about two companies that are licensed with, within the state. We have, uh, I think, two to four more that are, are being discussed. So we do anticipate this being a growing uh, business climate throughout the state, which is a good thing. Um, so a couple things to note, um, maximum operating requirement for unmanned aircraft right now within the state of North Dakota, 500 pounds or less. Um, if you're an operator, you need the remote pilot license, you need to be operating under somebody with the Part 137. Uh, if you have any FAA exemptions that are required um, to perform those services, you need to provide that within the licensing process. Um, you need to identify a chief pilot, the same safety meeting requirements apply um, as well. And uh, I think the biggest thing to note is pilot, pilot qualifications. You know, you need to be operating um, as, a, uh, as a pilot prior to being licensed um, within the state of North Dakota. So 25 hours uh, of minimum flight um, where, uh, where, you're sol where you're running solo flight operational loads is, is our minimum requirement to operate uh, in the state. So we, we're working with individuals and companies um, this is new for the state of North Dakota. We're trying to, to provide an opportunity for these businesses to, to flourish, uh, but we also want to make sure that, that the, the safety of that flight is not being compromised as well. And we're, we're still protecting people and property on the ground. And so, um, oh, and the last thing I want to mention too is that pesticide certification from NDSU is also a requirement as well. And so kind of a new arena with us. We're obviously open to continual dialogue, but if this is something anybody is interested in, feel free to reach out to us as we, we move forward to license our UAS operators within the state of North Dakota. Uh, we also want to denote that it is a separate license, and so if you are a manned operator and you're interested in also operating unmanned, it is a separate application because it does have set, uh, different requirements. Uh, that being said, it's, uh, if you have a manned license, uh, the fee is waived. And so if you meet the requirements of the unmanned license, you will not have to pay the $200 fee, but you will have a license to be a manned operator and a license to be an unmanned operator. And just a reminder about the website tools on the Aeronautics Commission website. We have the Met Tower database uh, where you can go, and we, we, we st uh, still still requirement in the state. So any uh, wind tower companies that are are putting up Met Towers need to identify the Latin long longitudes um, and place those on the website. So before operating for the season, it's always good to check out uh, if there's any new Met Tower sites for you to be aware of. Uh, additionally, the Department of Agriculture has a great resource with their um, agricultural sensitive area map. I'm sure all of you are aware of that. Just a great tool to go in and ensure that you're aware of all the different sensitive areas uh, throughout the state. And also just a reminder, when we're looking at the General Aviation Airport pavement projects in 2023, just for your awareness, a couple big projects. You know, Crosby is going to be doing a pavement reconstruction, so that airport will be closed for uh, about three months uh, this season. So if there, you have any operations up there, just a reminder to uh, make accommodations uh, you know, now. Uh, we're also looking at potential overlays for Lakota, West Hope, and Leeds for those airports at this time, so there may be impacts there. And then there's a listing here of different apron and taxiway and airfield seal coat projects as well. So just a reminder, as always, check NOTAMs, be visiting with the airport managers uh, that you're working with in the season ahead so that you can prepare accordingly. And then just a statistical update. It's always fun to take a look at last year and where, where we were in the aerial applicator world. Um, you know, at the end of every season, we, re we require the aerial applicators all throughout the state to report their acreages to us. And last year was a great season overall. And so we had close to 5 million acres sprayed, 4.7 million, um, which is about 1 million over the 10-year average. And so it was a, a wetter season uh, last year. And so, you know, the, the previous two seasons were, were dry seasons and, and were, were, we had a much lower acreages being reported. And so it was a great season for the state of North Dakota and the aerial applicator world. And we hope that the following one uh, is the same. And looking at the historical aerial applicator numbers in North Dakota, um, this is a graphic that kind of shows the historical trend. The amount of aerial applicator aircraft you, you can see, um, 
You know, at one point we had over 300, we had close to 400 air lapidator aircraft in the state. Now we're we're hovering around, you know, uh, 200 and around 200. And it's it's kind of plateaued, and so we have larger aircraft, turbine aircraft now operating in the state that can carry heavier loads, and so we need less aircraft to service the same amount of acreage. And we're seeing the same trend in the actual amount of air lapidator businesses. So obviously we're hoping this trend does not continue to go down. We're hoping that we're seeing a leveling off and a plateau of the amount of aircraft and the amount of air lapidator licenses in the state. So in 2022, we had 96 air lapidator businesses that have utilized 191 aircraft with 172 pilots. And so again, we hope that those numbers uh, uh, continue to stay where they're at or, or grow moving forward. And so that's it for my portion. I guess before we move on, are there any questions that any of you may have for the Aeronautics Commission? What year was that peak? 1990? What was that, Toby? The peak on your graph is 20. For right here? Right there. What year? Uh, that is 1985. Kind of hard to see on this screen, but yeah. Absolutely. So I haven't seen national trends, but that would be interesting to look at as well. But uh, these are the, some of the statistics we keep at, at our office. So, okay, any other questions? Uh, yes, sir. Do you keep any data on like the average age of the real applicators and stuff like that? The actual age of the pilots? Yeah. Uh, that is not something that we necessarily track. You know, I wonder if the North Dakota Agricultural Aviation Association would have anything to say about that. I know, Brian, I don't know if you guys track that or... Well, nationally, a couple of years ago, the average age was uh, around 55. Average age was 55 for air lap care pilots? Yeah. Throughout the country? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. more than that, wasn't it, Brian? Or 57? Yeah, it may have, might have been 57. Sure. A bit yeah, we, we know that there's a, an aging population, and so... Um, I've spoken just recently to some operators around North Dakota that are transitioning and, and selling their businesses to, to the, the next generation. And so, you know, I'm really hoping that we have some good mentorship uh, programs and opportunities available for you guys moving forward uh, and making sure there is kind of that next pilot generation there. A lot of the challenges we have right now in the aviation community, you know, includes getting enough uh, pilots, you know, in the workforce. So we're aware of that, and the aerial application is is is, uh, is an industry that's obviously impacted it just as well as the other lines of business within aviation as well. So, absolutely. I'd like to introduce uh, Rebecca Orgard from the uh, Department of Agriculture to give her update. Hi, I'm Rebecca Orgard with the North Dakota Department of Agriculture. I'm your Region One Pesticide Inspector. Um, so across the state of North Dakota there are six inspectors. Each of us have a specific region and we're mainly doing use inspections. So we're checking your PPE while you're loading. Um, I don't really care what you're flying in, whether it's the shorts and sandals or whatever, but when you get out to load and mix, please have your PPE on you guys. This is protecting you. Um, we're handling complaints that come in for drift. Um, and if there's any way possible that you could avoid making your turns over interstate, we get a lot of calls on that. And we also get a lot of calls if you're flying directly over farmyards or houses, just like Kyle mentioned. If you can somehow avoid that in your trajectory route, that would be great. Um, and your commercial applicator records and facility inspections. So we're going to come out and we're going to make sure that your proof of insurance is up to date and that your records are sufficient. Now the records are protecting you guys too. Um, your drift management, so you're watching for a label language uh, specifically for your aerial applicators and your rates are severely different between ground and air. So making sure that you're reading the label and double checking that everything is properly calibrated and working good on your airplanes. Uh, you're paying attention to your inversions. If your air... Okay. In my area, if you're driving out to do something and the dust behind you on the road just hangs there and doesn't leave or anything, it's probably an inversion. So don't spray. Um, then we just tell you to go home. So it's kind of the same when you're flying. If 
you're out there and you see like low lane fog down in the valleys and stuff that just kind of hangs there and isn't leaving, don't spray you guys. We've had reports of inversions traveling two and a half miles from the area that it was supposed to be sprayed in. Um, if you are utilizing reciprocity from another state for your certified applicator license, please double check North Dakota state laws, especially if you're spraying in North Dakota. If you're spraying in North Dakota, you have to follow North Dakota law. Now, if you're hiring pilots from Canada, there is no reciprocity with Canada. They have to test in North Dakota and pass it in order to spray in North Dakota. Montana, South Dakota, Minnesota, those all have reciprocity. You just got to go in and fill out the paperwork for it. Um, Paraquat, there is a lot of additional training required for Paraquat. Um, I'll touch on that in just a second here. And if you're applying pesticides in tribal lands, you need to Google request for applicator certification in Indian country and then there's a form that you fill out with the EPA. Please fill out your records completely and keep them organized. Now, the North Dakota Department of Agriculture has PDF fillable forms for your records. So you just get on there and fill out your form. I, yeah. Part of the requirement for while you're spraying is that your label is on hand while you're in the field spraying. Now, kellysolutions.com, as long as you can pull that up on your phone while you're spraying, that counts as having your label on hand at the time. Now, back to Paraquat, just a little bit there. So, just because your name of the spray is Paraquat does not mean that your active ingredient is. So your active ingredient is sometimes listed differently. So just pay attention to that, you guys. Um, it's a little bit fuzzy, sorry. So when you're spraying, you have your label, and I'm hoping everybody is reading the label and paying attention to it, because your label is where you're going to get your best information on what you're doing. So it's talking about your environmental hazards. Don't spray over the water. So turn off your booms if you're going to head over water, if you have to in your path. Um, and it talks about how you need your additional training for Paraquat. And this is what your certificate of completion for the Paraquat training looks like. Now the Paraquat training is through the EPA. So you're going to Google EPA Paraquat and it should pop you up to the specific course you need to take. It's not really hard, it's only about 45 minutes and it walks you through the requirements for that specific spray. That specific spray is mentioned in getting hit hard because there has been a lot of people misapplying and misusing it. And we want to keep as many sprays as we can out there. The more misuse that there is, then the harder EPA comes down on it. And then sometimes they totally remove it, like they have chlorpyrifos. Um, so let's just keep following the rules. And then we get to keep them for as long as possible when they're doing a good job in the first place. Okay. So if you come out of this with nothing else, Make sure you know that some of these are completely toxic to aluminum. So if you're not spraying and washing out your uh, spray tanks and if you spill any on your airplane wing or anything, if you're not cleaning all of that off right away, it can eat through it. Um, and I don't know about you guys, but I would never want to fly in something that has been eaten through just a little bit. That just does not seem safe to me. Um, now you get the complaints. You've heard them about, oh, there was an airplane flying over my house. He had to have been spraying. I know it. Sometimes if you just talk to these people ahead of time, it goes miles. Now there are pesticide um, information fact sheets at this website. And maybe if you don't even want to talk to them, just slip it in their mailbox. That might even go a long way towards helping with community relations. Um, back on water quality. So, guys, there are, in the state of North Dakota, it is illegal to apply most pesticides over or near groundwater. You got to be following your buffer zones. 
uh, if you do absolutely have to, like you're out there spraying for mosquitoes or something, you need a permit from the North Dakota Department of Environmental Quality at least 20 days in advance. And the reason they're doing this is they have test sites across North Dakota and they're testing the water at each of those sites. Now at 99% of them, they found atrazine. Even if people are following directly on label, sometimes it's still getting in that water supply. So, I mean, we just gotta be careful with it. Now, Kyle touched on this a little bit, the sensitive crops and bees. So it is your responsibility as an applicator to go out and spot and look for bees or water or AP, um, sorry, <laughs> or your organic farms and notify them before you're going to be spraying. So you can go to this website right here and if you fill out an applicator um, spot in the, under the pesticide part of it, it will automatically pull up a map and if you click yes down when you page down after you filled out your applicator part, it will automatically notify any of the apiaries within two miles of your application site and that counts as you're letting them know and the computer system does it for you, you don't have to go out and pull up and call every single apiary out there. The other things that it has on that site is your organic farms, the little blue dots are the apiaries, and the purple dots are the vineyards. Same with the vineyards. Go in there, fill out your pesticide application spot, and it notifies them. The other thing we want to watch out for is our current administration is very strict on some of the endangered and threatened species. So on some labels there's a threatened and endangered species part that says you have to get on to the bulletins live too and within six months of your application you have to print out a bulletin. Now those bulletins have to be on your person while you're spraying. So if you don't want to carry the paper snap a picture of it on your phone just like with the paraquat training certificate snap a picture on your phone pin it so that you can have proof that it's there that you did it okay now currently this is only on over the top dicamba however since you guys can't even use that in an airplane it's just going to be a really fast overview so this is what the website looks like get on there pick the printable bulletin up in the corner after you pick what product you're using, print it off. Make sure you write your name, date, time on there. Okay? Now, Project Safe Send. Aubrey Sandral is in charge of this. And what it is, is if you have any pesticides that you're not using, aren't going to use again, any fungicides, any fumigants, anything like that, and especially if it's a fumigant and you don't want to store it, you go to the Safe Send site, you don't even have to get out of your pickup. They will take it for take it out of your pickup for you, unless you have one of those special pickups that need, you know, a little tweaking, a little sweet talking to get the tailgate open. Then if you could open the tailgate, that'd be great. Um, but otherwise they come and get the pesticide out and they will dispose of it for you. Uh, so if there's anything laying around that you know you're not going to use, just clean it up and get rid of it, especially if it's been there like 10, 15 years, freezing, thawing, freezing, thawing. It's probably not going to work the way you want it to, and it's not going to be worth it. Or, like chlorpyrifos has a 100% ban on it right now. They took all the labeling and everything off from it, so if you still have some on hand, even if it's just for your farmyard, you can't use it. So bring it here and get rid of it. If you have more than a thousand pounds that you're going to be bringing in, please call in advance. There are typically six sites across North Dakota during the summer. Those sites for this year have not been announced yet. When they have been announced, they'll be on the Department of Agriculture website. Well, thank you for listening, guys. Just like uh, Rebecca had said previously, uh, communication is absolutely key as you're uh, providing those aerial applicator services to 
um, your clients and, and to any of the, the individuals that live in that region. And so it's just something to consider as you move forward. Just make sure that uh, you do the best you can at, at communicating. Uh, something I also wanted to just mention too, I know some of these slides might be a little blurry for you. Um, this will be able to be accessed uh, from our website uh, in the upcoming week ahead. And, and so um, feel free to come back and take a look at some of this, these materials. We'll try to get uh, this, these actual slides posted as well, if that's possible. And so, um, so this can be reference material for you to use moving forward. The, uh, the next speaker we have for you today is uh, Daniel Miller with the Northern Plains UAS test site. Um, obviously unmanned aircraft, um, it's a new entrant into our national airspace system over the last uh, decade and, and uh, we're privileged to have one of the congressionally authorized test sites within, within the country. Uh, we're really a leader in this space and so um, we're privileged to have him here today to talk more about this subject uh, because our goal is, is, as it always has been, to ensure that we have the safe integration of unmanned aircraft systems. Uh, and minimal if no impact on manned operations and so that's always been the goal from the beginning and so again I appreciate her being here and uh, let's hear an update from them so let's give her a hand all right thank you Kyle all right so as Kyle mentioned I am Danielle Miller with the Northern Plains US test site so a little bit about me I actually uh, live in farm up in northeastern North Dakota in the Fordville area if anyone is familiar with that it's about an hour uh, northwest of Grand Forks uh, so of course in addition to that I am the director of safety at the Northern Plains US test site I've been with the test site since about uh, 2018 so before we dive in, I'll just give a little update, um, uh, a little about Northern Plains U.S. test site uh, for those who may not be familiar. Uh, so we were designated as an FAA test site back in 2013. And as Kyle mentioned, uh, it's our mission to safely integrate a manned aircraft into the national airspace with minimal impact. Um, so how do we do that? Uh, typically what we do falls into kind of three buckets. Number one, uh, research and development. Um, we work with different entities and organizations on uh, research and development to advance drone technology and basically kind of move beyond what's, what's possible today with unmanned aircraft. Uh, number two, we're consultants. Uh, we provide subject matter expertise uh, to those drone operators looking to do advanced drone operations in the airspace. And the third bullet there is facilities and assets. Uh, we work to deploy the infrastructure and services necessary uh, for safe advanced drone operations in the airspace. And that really hits on kind of the, the last bullet you see on the slide there. We administer the Vantis program for the state of North Dakota. Uh, so that's the state of North Dakota's infrastructure program in which we are uh, uh, leading and managing. I'm going to talk uh, in detail about that later in the slide deck. So. I'll leave it at that for now. So it's my goal today to really give you a few updates and the status of what's happening in the drone industry. Uh, we'll look at uh, what's been going on the past year, what's to come in the uh, remainder of 2023. Um, so with that, I plan to go over some UAS traffic management and remote ID updates. Uh, advancements in rulemaking for drone operations. Um, let's see, a fun one, we're going to talk about how uh, we can use drones to collect weather data. And then I will uh, dive into the details on the updates for the Vantage Network. So the first couple are really going to be kind of a look at kind of the, the national updates uh, such as UTM and advancements in rulemaking. And then the, the second two are going to look at really some local updates here in North Dakota. So first off, UAS traffic management and remote ID. Uh, basically at the test site, there's ongoing work supporting the advancements in UAS traffic management to enable other users of the airspace to have awareness of drone operations. UTM is really a lot more than just that, but I think that's one thing, one piece of it that you all will find valuable in the future to have an increased level of awareness of UAS operations going on in the airspace. Another piece of that um, is remote ID. 
Uh, so what remote what remote ID is, it's going to be similar to, you could say, um, ADSB for drones, or it's going to be a digital license plate for drones. Um, it's really going to enable a drone in flight to provide identification and location information um, that will be made available to entities such as the FAA and local law enforcement. Um, so that's going to really help um, increasing awareness on the drone operations that are going on in the airspace. Um, so remote ID is relatively new. Um, the rule went into effect back in April of 2021. Um, and now the operators and manufacturers have had some time to uh, learn, understand that rule, understand what they need to do, um, what changes they need to make in order to comply with that rule. So the deadline for operators to comply with that rule is coming up now, uh, September 16th of 2023. So the next topic we have is advancements in rulemaking. So coming in February of 2024, we're going to res we're going to be seeing a notice of proposed rulemaking for UAS operations using special airworthiness. So this follows the Beyond Visual Line of Sight Aviation Rulemaking Committee report that was published in March of 2022. Um, and that report was really a product of the Beyond Visual Line of Sight Aviation Rulemaking Committee um, efforts um, as they gathered for about a year regularly um, to address the fact that FAA regulations really don't currently support uh, integration, safe integration of drones into the national airspace in an efficient, scalable way. So a team of industry um, experts um, to include, you know, those in the manned industry, the unmanned industries gathered um, regularly for about a year to address, address the lack of FAA regulations for uh, drones in the airspace. And they were able to produce um, um, recommendations, which the FAA is now using as they develop this rule. So it's going to be exciting to see. Uh, the notice of proposed rulemaking come out in February of 2024. Um, what do we expect to see in that notice of proposed rulemaking? Um, expect it's going to enable certain low altitude UAS operations uh, while ensuring the safety and efficiency of the airspace. Uh, we expect it to include a new regulatory process uh, for issuing special airworthiness certificates for unmanned aircraft as well as the acceptance of their associated elements. And we really feel this is going to be uh, the next step in incrementally integrating UAS into the NAS, providing expanded safety, societal, and economic benefits. Uh, and I just want to emphasize uh, one key, key thing in this, this future rule I uh, feel is going to be key is the uh, solution for uh, air an airworthiness certificate for drones. Um, Having this pathway is really going to be able to allow drone operators to ensure that they have the level of safety they need uh, to uh, operate safely and efficiently in the airspace. So we're really looking forward to that. Okay, the next one, uh, using drones to gather uh, weather data. Uh, this is something uh, that's really gaining momentum in our northeastern corner of the state near Grand Forks. Um, so first off, um, a variety of sensors are used, of course, to gather weather information and then ingest it into forecast models to produce our, our forecasts and provide us with current conditions. Uh, one, one issue is that most of those sensors are at the surface. Uh, of course, we do have weather balloons uh, throughout the country uh, that help us with that, providing us with that snapshot of uh, kind of the, the atmospheric snapshot. Uh, trouble is, uh, the weather balloons are few and far between. Um, so this is where, where drones can help, and this is what we're, we're uh, starting to do in northeastern North Dakota is using drones to, as a supplement to weather balloons to, to fill the gap. For an example, um, if you, we use Grand Forks as an example, the nearest weather balloons to Grand Forks is about 20, 200 miles to the northeast at International Falls and then 200 miles to the southwest in Bismarck. 
Um, so there's a big gap there. So we're looking to fill those gaps um, with UAS and using UAS to fly vertical profiles uh, similar to a weather balloon, capturing, capturing that data. And really the goal is to gather more data to provide a more precise, accurate uh, information for those forecast models. Um, and really the goal here in the end is to increase safety efficiency of operations for unmanned and manned operators. Um, so you have a better understanding of weather, weather conditions in the atmosphere. On the bottom uh, right hand corner of the screen you can see uh, what we call what they call a meteor drone. So this is the drone that they are using um, up near uh, Grand Sky, Grand Forks Air Force Base to um, gather, gather that weather data. They're looking to fly it. Vertical profiles up to 16,900 feet. Okay, so that covers uh, three of the four topics and the last is Vantis. Uh, so as, as a reminder, or for those who may not be familiar, Vantis is North Dakota's UAS network. Um, the intention of Vantis is really to deploy infrastructure and services necessary across the state for advanced uh, drone operations. Um, let's see, as you can see on the slide here, the intent of the Vantis network is really to support multiple use cases and customers. And so, like I mentioned, um, looking to deploy infrastructure and services necessary for safe drone, oper drone operations in the airspace. So what is necessary for those safe drone operations in the airspace or what, are, what is going to help those drone pilots? Number one, if you take a look at the right hand side of the slide, we'll start at the top, remote infrastructure. So one piece of the Vantis network is the deployment of a reliable network of radios, uh, which the a drone operator uses to communicate and control their aircraft. Uh, that second piece of the remote infrastructure is the surveillance sensors that we are deploying across the state. We're deploying primary surveillance radar as well as ADSB sensors, uh, which is key uh, because then we are providing that information uh, to the pilot as they are controlling the aircraft. They get to see it on a display. So when you are um, flying in the airspace as well, they can identify where you are and be sure to give way um, to you all in the airspace. Uh, let's see, working down the right hand side of the slide, you can see our backhaul data network where the Vantas network is leveraging StageNet, North Dakota's fiber network for our uh, connection to our mission and network operations center, which is located at Grand Sky near the Grand Forks Air Force Base. Our mission and network operations center is where we control and monitor the health of the network. So I'll we'll talk about those network elements in a bit more detail here on the next slide. Um, so kind of working from left to right across this slide, you can see our, uh, our primary surveillance radar in the picture on the left. You can see we're installed and operating in the western side of the state. Um, looking at the state of North Dakota there, our initial deployment of the network was in the Watford City area. And now we are expanding up to Williston as well. Um, let's see, the next picture going from left to right, we have our communications radios, which is installed on a DOT tower, uh, DOT towers out west in the Watford City area. And then, like I mentioned, we're using that StageNet fiber network uh, to connect to our Mission Network Operations Center on the eastern side of the state. Uh, you can see our Mission and Network Operations Center, um, the two photos on the right. Um, you can see the inside of our Mission and Network Operations Center, we have the, a wall of those screens which show uh, network health and status. It shows status of the UAS operations. Um, they're monitoring weather and so on. Okay, and now a closer look at um, what the UAS operation looks like uh, leveraging Vantis. So if you look at the picture in the middle, you can see an aircraft that is about to take off and in the, in the background you can see the uh, UAS operator's ground control station in the white van. And then in the picture on the right, you can see the inside of the uh, drone operator's ground control station. 
Uh, one of the displays that they are looking at in that ground control station includes uh, the Vantis display, which is displaying um, the surveillance information captured by the ADS-B sensors and the uh, primary surveillance radar, like I mentioned a minute ago. Um, so they are able to uh, real-time monitor um, the airspace around them to be sure they are um, giving way to any traffic in, in their area. Okay. You can see the display that they are looking at, too, in the uh, bottom left-hand side of the screen there. Okay, so that is kind of Vantis in a nutshell, our 2023 updates. Uh, number one, infrastructure expansion. Like I mentioned, we started in the Watford City area. We're expanding up to Williston. Uh, and then uh, next up, which we will be seeing this year, is expansion to the Fargo area as well as Grand Forks. Um, we're going to be doing continued testing, operations, and maintenance on the network. Uh, community engagement, um, it's a, a high priority to get out and talk with communities, you all, other users of the airspace, to be sure we are working together and collaborating on this effort uh, to integrate drones into the airspace. And another, another big update for us, um, we received our first Beyond Visual Line of Sight approval leveraging Vantage from the FAA in the very end of 2022. Um, so this was a big news. It was a couple years of work, a couple years in the making, but um, we did have some success at the end of last year. And this approval allows operations beyond visual line of sight um, of the remote pilot command and, and visual observers, and rather using that electronic observer that's in the ground control station, moni ground control station monitoring the display that I talked about earlier. earlier. So this approval really, uh, really demonstrates um, the, the acceptance that we've received from the FAA on our operation, uh, which is a huge step forward and really illustrates kind of the maturity of the network and, and the safety case associated with Vantas flight operations. Okay, so next up, I um, believe this is the last slide, so just kind of a look at uh, what's next uh, for Vantis. What, what are you going to see to come in 2023? Like I mentioned, increased operations uh, in western North Dakota, um, and then continued expansion in 2023 to the eastern side of the state. Okay, that's all I have. I really appreciate you all listening and happy to take any questions. We do have a booth um, at the uh, conference the next couple days as well, and we have a team of us who would be happy to chat further on the test site in Vantis. Any questions? Are the, uh, is the Vantis system or any other traffic management system been tested with the unique operations of agricultural aircraft? Yes, we have. So, yeah, question was, have we conducted testing um, with the unique operations of agriculture aircraft? Yes, we have. Um, let's see. So, we conduct operational testing in which we had uh, flight operators um, operating out in western North Dakota. Um, we did some um, um, kind of planned encounter scenarios in which we had the operator monitoring the display and maneuvering um, to ensure they were able to ensure traffic separation. Um, and we have done the low altitude kind of inconsistent flight profiles in which is common of agriculture aircraft. So yes, we have done that testing. Was that using ADS? Um, we did turn ADSB off to ensure we were um, capturing the data that that we need to. With radar, then. Yes, we were capturing with that our primary surveillance radar. Yep. Uh, back to remote ID. Are there apps available that you can put on your own phone to pick up remote ID signals? Not currently. Potentially in the future. Wasn't that signal supposed to be compatible with personal devices? Yes, it is. Yep. 
Yep, as I mentioned, it's, it's still new. I expect remote ID information will be available to FAA, local law enforcement, et cetera, in, in its initial phases. Um, and then we will see where it goes from there on, on expanding out, expanding from there. Okay, thank you. My name is Brian Rao. My wife Ellie and I run a flying service out of Medina, North Dakota, just down the road here. And I last year just completed my 45th year of crop spraying. And when I was asked to uh, give this presentation, I was kind of wondering what I could do in 20 minutes to affect safety. And you guys can judge and see, see how we did here. And so I thought I'd just start with an accident review of 2022. So these were our NTSB reported accidents. We all know there's accidents that happen that aren't reported, but the only way we can gauge this is really by reported accidents. So there were 15 CFITs, nine of which were power lines. Uh, there were seven power loss accidents. Now the NTSB as of late, leaves many of the reports incomplete. And um, sometimes the only information is where and when the accident happened. So there's six in that category yet. There were four landing accidents. There were four airframe mechanical accidents. You know, airframe mechanical, they can be things, uh, you know, as simple as brakes not working. You, I'm surprised through the years, um, you go and look up the NTSB accidents and how many accidents were caused just by brakes not working properly, either not coming on or locking on or some such thing. And I should add that all these NTSB accidents and reports, you can go to their website and you can do a search for Part 137 accidents in a given time period and uh, it's all available and uh, you can learn a lot from those, those type of reports. There were three takeoff accidents, uh, two stalls, and NTSB reported accidents that are stalls are almost always fatal, so they'll make the fatal list too. Any of you helicopter guys watching this, there were two settling with power. Uh, there was uh, two fuel exhaustions. There was one diverted attention. There was one in-flight fire. One that's just general loss of control. And there was one mid-air collision. Back to fuel, fuel exhaustion. I don't know how many of you all use a fuel control, a flow control, but uh, they're very accurate as long as you put the uh, correct information in and you're not porting fuel out any place or anything. So there are some things that we can, we can do to mitigate some of these accidents. Talking about the fatal accidents, um, again, back to this, a lot of them aren't very complete. There's about four of them that were incomplete. Um, you, we'll look at the fatal accidents and you guys can decide what you think they were. Sometimes there's very little information there. But again, there's those two stall accidents, unfortunately. Uh, there's one C-fit wires, one C-fit tower, and the one mid-air down in Arkansas, which had, uh, of course, two planes, but uh, one, one fatality with that. So let's, uh, let's go over the, uh, the accidents a little bit here, the fatal accidents anyway. And so I've just written, taken out parts of the highlights of uh, what the NTSB report did. And this accident was in Arkansas. I can't read it there. I'm going to have to read up here. Um, it was in Arkansas. It was a uh, AGCAT, a turbine powered. I believe it was a, uh, a Garrett engine on it. And this was not only a first year pilot, this was going to be her first uh, paying job actually in her career. Uh, she was out practicing in the morning with the aircraft. Uh, another company pilot flew the aircraft to set it up for fertilizer work. Um, the pilot, the accident pilot then took, the, took off, practiced some more, came back and loaded for her first uh, paying job and headed out to the field. 
the operation has a uh, business band type radios and the operator heard the pilot say I've got to land this airplane and that's all that's really known about it. The aircraft hit a, in Arkansas, you know, levees and rice fields and everything, hit a levee and crossed the water and came to rest on the east side of the ditch and then the, uh, the aircraft uh, was destroyed in the post-impact fire. And so uh, this one is definitely unknown, incomplete, uh, what, what happened there. Another accident was an R-44 down in Texas. Um, this uh, most likely is CFIT wires. Um, so a helicopter, the loader heard metallic sounds and then heard the sound of an impact. And the, the only other thing of significance that the report showed is that the wire, wires that appeared to be hidden in the tree canopy. So again, I should add, all, even all these, uh, these fatal accidents are still listed as preliminary in the NTSB reports, but there's enough on some of them that you can kind of figure out what's going on. This one also is probably wires, and yet um, there were no witnesses, but there was a damaged power line located on the western edge of the field, and then it showed this picture, and that's really all the information that was there. If you look close at this picture, you, you can see a power line here, but uh, you can't tell if that's the power line that was damaged or not from, from this picture. And there wasn't enough information in the NTSB report to indicate whether that was the accident field or not, but obviously where the aircraft came to rest. And then a thrush down in Arkansas. This aircraft struck an antenna guy wire. And uh, what was significant about this one was that uh, the pilot had been briefed extensively on the location of the tower and that the tower was in the field. But even with that briefing that it hit the field, hit the tower, the guy wire, and uh, caused a fatal accident. Another one in Arkansas. This was the midair between two 802s, 1802 and 1802A. Uh, and so there was one fatality and one serious injury. And uh, one aircraft was transitioning the area. The other aircraft was working a field and was turning up. And it, according to the report, it appears that the, the aircraft turning pulled up into the uh, transitioning aircraft. Now, it doesn't give any information on how high these aircraft were. Uh, weather, they do have a weather report, and that didn't look to be like it was a factor in it that, that the pilot had to fly low or anything. But... For you, you uh, pilots uh, listening to this, um, if you fly around 802s and 602s and stuff, you have to probably be higher than 500 feet to stay above those guys turning around. But it does. The report does not say that, that uh, what altitudes these people were operating at. Um, the aircraft pulling up, um, and it doesn't say what hit what on the aircraft. Was able to travel about a quarter mile and then. Uh, crashed in the field and the other one spun in and that's where the fatality was. And then a 502 in Louisiana. Uh, it's pr this one, as I read this, I'm thinking stall, but the NTSB really didn't indicate that. Um, aircraft impacted the ground and the only thing of significance is these two reports, uh, witnesses. And they both describe, to a layman, they might describe somebody trying to do aerobatic maneuvers. But uh, to me, it, it sounds like a stall. The, uh, as you read here, it talks about the airplane performing a barrel roll to the left. Um, the other witness said the airplane went belly up and then rolled headed to straight to the ground. To me, it seems like that would be a, you know, a left stall carrying too much bottom rudder. The left wing stalls first and tucks under and the airplane goes over. One thing about stalls that we're starting to see, it seems like that we're starting to see is that uh, a lot of the times these stalls happen in actually pretty calm, nice flying weather. People are flying and they're pulling hard and they may be, some have speculated, they may be hit, hitting their own weight turbulence. I know as a, uh, as a pilot, um, anytime I get the indication at all that I'm in, if I'm in a turn and I feel a, uh, something that feels like weight turbulence to me, I immediately stick the stick forward and unload the wings, even if I'm not pulling all that hard. 
it just seems to be uh, something I've developed through the years, and I think most, most pilots with experience uh, would say that too. Remember, an, an, un, an unloaded wing can't stall, so uh, uh, watch the turns. Well, oh, I bet I picked up the wrong one here. There we go. And uh, so this one, uh, very little information on it. The airplane was, the pilot was flying back to the airstrip from a load, and it hit, uh, it hit the ground halfway in between. Weather did not appear to be a factor. So very incomplete, not knowing what went on here. A helicopter accident, a Huey actually, um, in California. And so this is where the pilot and ground crew are working several fields. The, you know, they load the, and they, they jump each other. The, uh, the, the truck moves to the next field and uh, the, the truck driver and loader reported that the, air, the helicopter never showed up at the next field. And eventually the helicopter was found uh, on the ground near a place where the pilot was known to, uh, known to land and take breaks at. And uh, weather again did not appear to be a factor. So another one really unknown here. Another one unknown um, in Washington, a 602. Um, all it says is the airplane impacted a airplane impacted the ground and uh, consistent with the uh, airplane being a flat, shallow left wing low attitude is the only information that's available on this accident. So again that's the review of the fatal accidents. Um, but let's talk a little bit about uh, improvements. Through the years I've heard all kinds of things being suggested as ways to improve our uh, industry, training, safety culture. I've got some information coming up that you know maybe safety culture is a is a is a is an issue here. Do we have a good culture of safety in our business? Um, you know, best management practices. Do we need to study? Do we do need more information on the metrics? Do we need to study accidents better? Do we need safer aircraft? Uh, do we need fatigue management? Uh, better avionics? Uh, all those things have been suggested. And uh, I'm glad that most of you ag guys are listening to this probably over, over the internet because otherwise I'd probably have things thrown at me right now if I bring up the word safety management systems. Um, uh, not very popular only because, only because we don't like a lot of extra paperwork and things, I think. Most of us are doing these things already and some of the larger ag companies have started safety management systems. Um, you can't argue, you know, their effects on safety. The airlines have been doing them for a long time. Uh, there currently is a proposal out there to require this for charter and air tour operators. And if you want more information on, on SMS, uh, just go to FAA.gov and search SMS. You'll get all kinds of information on it. And again, I, and I'm not here promoting actually that we have formal safety management systems in Ag aviation. Um, you know, if you've got a best management practice, you're already doing some of this. This, this is a process of writing it all down and uh, analyzing it. Really, let's say you had a goal of having less, having to re less times of flying out to a field and having to return because of weather, not completing the mission. Say that was one of your goals you had. That would be the goal. And you know, so how would you how would you do that? How would you manage that? You would maybe, uh, you know, in our industry now these days, uh, Kyle mentioned earlier, less aircraft, but we're going a long ways. How do we know what the weather is like a long ways away? Well, the, you know, maybe there's things like remote weather stations. Maybe there's a drone we can send over there someday to get weather. Um, and anyway, those would be the methods. And then the training would be how do you use all those? How do you use the you know the DOT website for for weather and the and the end on site and all those type of things and to train on them and then to figure out a year later or two years later if that 
actually helped. That would be an example of an item in safety management system. But, and so, so many people say, well, this is just going to be a form I stick in the file. And if that's, it, if that's what it ends up being, no, it, it wouldn't be a lot of help. And honestly, a lot of us, uh, according to Kyle's number, I think there's maybe about one to two pilots per operator in North Dakota. And you kind of think, well, why go through all this? Uh, just I know what it is in my mind. So, I, But it, writing it down has value. Studying it has value. And even if you're a single plane operation like mine, eventually hopefully you're going to sell it to somebody or bring another pilot on. And um, so I think, think it's something to consider. But knowing there's resistance to that, what can we do in the meantime? Let's, let's think a little bit about training. Um, I'm well aware that many of you are either um, are watching this because either you didn't care to or weren't able to make to a PASS program. But uh, let's talk a little bit about uh, PASS. Um, it's a program by the National Agricultural Aviation Association to reduce accidents, reduce drift incidents. Now we have new material every year. It tends to cover the same subjects on about a four or five year cycle because we end up killing ourselves the same way we have since the beginning. And so, um, so we, we do cover the same general topics, but it's always new material. So if you miss a year, you miss a lot. Um, I don't know if you're going to be able to read this. Uh, what the NAAA did was uh, they're in their 25th year pass. And so they took and looked from 2014 to 2020 um, who had the number of accidents and if they had attended pass and how often they attended pass. And I see this is small, so I'm going to try to, uh, to read this to you here. The, uh, on this side is the accidents. That says 117, and those were people who had no, had never attended pass in the last five years. This is number 52 for those who attended uh, once in the last five years, twice in the last five years, three in the last five years, four and five, and uh, and the number of accidents you can see there. Now, a statistician might tell you that these numbers are all probably not may not be statistically significant but I think the trend line is definitely significant to attend what training you can and um, I've had some other people tell me well this is this is the people that don't care about safety and these are the people who do care about safety and it's not the past program it's it's the uh, culture safety that we talked about well even if that would be true that would take some more evaluations to tell if that's true or not but even if that would be true I would encourage you to be one of these people who care about safety enough to get to what training is available in the industry. And uh, so this last year, this current year, um, we're just finishing the season up, was on wire strikes. And what's, what's the greatest number of accidents in, uh, in ag aviation is C-FIT wire strikes. And um, there are real things you can do to keep wires in your mind, and there's real things you can do to uh, to prevent uh, accidents, wire strike accidents. As a matter of fact, uh, just to back up a little bit, uh, at our conference in Knoxville last year, there was a five-hour course just on wire, flying in the wire environment. And it was so well received at, that uh, we're going to have it next December again in Palm Springs, California. It's going to be a full eight-hour course on on wire strikes. This course was put together by a lot of the people in the helicopter industry, uh, but they've tailored it to ag aviation, helicopter and fixed wing. The, uh, um, you know, there's just not too many people who fly around in the wire environment like we do. You know, EMS helicopters get down there, law enforcement gets down there, but nobody's in that environment all the time like, like ag is. And so we really need to take advantage of, uh, of training when it's available. Other training, um, for recurrent training, there is more and more simulator training becoming available. The reports I've heard on it indicate that it's, you know, as far as uh, the touch of an aircraft and the, the hands-on, it's, it's still not too realistic. You know, 
nobody's really got the full motion simulators or anything yet to, for ag aviation, but there are some that are getting better all the time and you can practice methods and procedures and it's good for that. There are flight schools. Uh, Fran de Kock up in Canada, he has foreign students who have to come to him every year for recurrent training. Um, now most of us, you know, got 45 years under, am I going to go to recurrent training? Probably not. But you know, you can, at the beginning of the year, we've got a long break in this uh, business before we start flying again. Beginning of the year, you can go out and fly some. In these, uh, these long-nosed aircraft that we have these days, people, uh, a lot of people don't recommend that you go out and do full stalls with these aircraft. But I mean, you can nibble on the stall and get in the practice of getting that in your head and unloading the wings right away. And you can do things like dumping a load safely at altitude, doing all these things at altitude. So I think, um, you know, short of going full-blown SMS, I think we need to, uh, we need to uh, take advantage of what is available. The past program's available. There's these other trainings that are available. Um, I had a, uh, a, and the other thing I hear about is people uh, in our industry, especially up in North Dakota, well, this is just a part-time job for me. Um, I don't know how flying ag part-time can possibly make you safer than flying ag full-time. And actually, flying ag in North Dakota is part-time for most all of us. Uh, one of my friends told me he flies for, for a freight company most of the year, and he says, well, I've got to go to flight sim twice a year. I don't want to go to pass again. You know? But I can't think of, and so just think, flying freight, he has to go to simulator training twice a year, but doesn't want to do what training is available for his, the ag portion of his career at all. It, uh, it's again, part-time isn't the answer, it might be part of the problem, and uh, I don't think in his case the, uh, the flight sim training for a 208 really had anything to do with ag aviation. So again, my, my only goal here was to, uh, to encourage everyone uh, to take advantage of what training is available. And with that, uh, I'm pretty much done, or, unless there's any questions or comments. Brian? Thank you. Really appreciate the perspective of an experienced aerial applicator here in North Dakota. And uh, so that's great information. Thank you so much for sharing that. Welcome. My name is Jeffrey Bull. I'm with the Fargo FAA safety team. I'm going to talk a little bit about managing uh, general aviation aircraft, aging general aviation aircraft. This presentation is designed to give you an overview of guidance on maintaining the airworthiness of the aging general aviation aircraft fleet. In September 2003, a team of aircraft manufacturers, owners, their representative organizations, engineers, and inspectors from the Federal Aviation Administration developed a best practices guide for maintaining aging general aviation airplanes. It consists of best practices beyond standard inspection requirements. The information covered in this presentation is based on that guide. This guide is endorsed by the AOPA, the Antique Airplane Association, the EAA, and the FAA. Uh, this presentation will cover inspection and maintenance guidance on older aircraft for owners of older small single engine airplanes and the technicians who maintain them. This will offer helpful tips for assessing the effects of aging on their airplane. You will also find that this program guides user groups or type groups to develop a checklist and gather reference information specific to a model type. Although targeted specifically for small single engine airplanes, much of the information in this presentation applies to the entire GA fleet. Actions owners take based on these best practices will help protect their investment and more importantly, help maintain the safety of their airplanes. A little background, uh, the GA fleet is 
approximately average age is 50 years old and there's 150,000 plus flying around out there. The GA fleet being used is being used well beyond flight hours and years and vision when the aircraft were designed. The bulk of the fleet is designed to civil aviation regulation standards, CAR-3, and they were developed in the 50s, 1950s or earlier. So obviously no consideration was made at that time about the aging aircraft issue. And annual 100-hour 100, 100 inspections, most small aircraft, regardless of age, are rarely, if ever, inspected beyond a non-intrusive annual or 100-hour inspections. So this is what we're kind of going through in this presentation, above and beyond inspections. Purpose, physical exams, information sharing, baseline checklist. Airplanes are kind of like people. As they age, they gain weight and start having issues they didn't have when they were young. I can certainly attest to that. Just as doctors recommend more frequent physical exams, the recommended practices and the best practices guide are beyond standard inspection requirements. Methods for mitigating the effects of aircraft aging parallel those used in medicine. Advances in medical science continue to result in new ways of detecting precursors to serious health problems. Health professionals recommend increasingly more intrusive inspections as people age. People accept these recommendations and generally request more thorough physicals as they age. The owners of older aircraft routinely form organizations, especially when the manufacturer no longer exists or provides little customer support. Uh, two best practices can fundamentally impact the way maintenance and inspection are approached for aging aircraft. Doing either of these helps assess the condition of the That should get you uh, some interesting records research. Uh, airworthiness directives. The, the database provides the, all FAA airworthiness air directives, airworthiness directives, ADs, that are still in effect, and many ADs that are no longer in effect, historical ADs. You can search for ADs or view them listed by AD number or make and model of aircraft. And that's where, if you look it up by make and model, it's where it will be where the make is actually the type certificate holder, Cessna, Beach, whoever, whoever holds the SDC at the time. And that kind of changes in the the FAA issues SAIBs to owners of affected aircraft model types, engines, props, or appliances such as instruments. An SAIB is not mandatory, but provides information regarding an airworthiness concern less serious than an unsafe condition addressed with an AD. SAIBs often reference manufacturer service bulletins and service letters. You can access the SAIB database at the following website. And this one's a little different. This is rgl.faa.gov. So, a little different than that DRS. This is a uh, database uh, special airworthiness uh, search 
page, I guess you could call it, under the Dynamic Regulatory System, DRS. Uh, you can find, I mean, all kinds of things, regulations and ACs, handbooks. I, there's just all kinds of things in it. The database is a searchable repository for all special airworthiness information bulletins. And you can look at them by their number or, again, by applicable make and model. And for each one, you, you, you'll view a, it comes in a PDF. Service bulletins, service letters, and service letters, I should say. Aircraft manufacturers issue service bulletins and service letters to address in-service issues or <clears throat> as a product improvement method. These are often instructions for accomplishing the mandatory actions of an AD. You can obtain service bulletins and service letters from the manufacturer and often from a models type club. And usually they're free. This represents the new service difficulty report homepage. So you get there by going to faa.gov and enter SDR in the home page search bar and it'll come up with this page. It allows users to electronically submit service difficulty and malfunction defect reports and to search and review all the submitted reports. The FAA's database of SDRs contains report, reported maintenance and service problems for any aircraft, engine, or component. An aircraft owner can search this database for model-specific or individual aircraft reports. This is going to help identify areas that may be candidates for special attention, especially if the logbooks are incomplete. This can be useful for determining any past difficulties for specific airplanes. The FAA operates a service difficulty reporting website for aircraft operators to report issues or malfunctions with aircraft components. And this can be accessed at sdrs.faa.gov. And this is just what the page looks like, the initial page. And 72M. For that, it comes up with 496 records. National Transportation Safety Board. Jeez, this is really working well here. Man. I'll get there. There we go. All right. The NTSB records. The, the NTSB Aviation Accident Database contains information from 1962 and later about civil aviation accidents and selected incidents within the United States, its territories, its possessions, and in international waters. The NTSB keeps descriptions of more than 140,000 aviation accidents in a searchable database. Searching this database helps the owners, operators, or mechanics determine whether their particular aircraft has ever been involved in an accident. There is a new search engine called Carol, C-A. So anyway, the NTSB database can help owners and operators or mechanics match up repairs on an aircraft to the reasons for those repairs. It can also help determine accident trends regarding a particular aircraft model. So for example, 
suppose a Piper PA-12 owner searches the NTSB database for Piper PA-12. In that case, they'll find that older Piper rudder posts were made of a steel alloy susceptible to fatigue cracking under normal service conditions. Certificates. STCs have been developed for many different types of aircraft. An STC allows for the modification or replacement of parts of an aircraft or the installation of new systems in accordance with approved plans and specifications. The STC is based on a thorough evaluation of the design, manufacturing, and testing data to ensure that the changes do not affect the safety or airworthiness of the aircraft. Once issued, an STC can be used to re retrofit similar aircraft models provided they meet the specified conditions. Mm, not so much anymore. Most STCs are serial, serial number specific to, to an aircraft. Design upgrades often have a positive effect on aging issues. A review of the FAA A supplemental type certificate is a document issued by the FAA approving a modification of a product, which can include aircraft or aircraft engine or propeller. And the SDC defines, defines the product design change, states how the modification affects the existing type design, and list serial number effectivity. It also identifies a certification basis listing specific regulatory compliance for the design change. Information contained in the certification basis is helpful for those applicants proposing subsequent product modifications and evaluating certification basis compatibility with other SGC modifications. Well, that was a big sentence there. Uh, basically, you when you go to install an STC and you have other STCs installed on your aircraft, you need to assure that the STC you're installing is compatible with the other STCs installed on your aircraft. All the STCs installed on your aircraft may be applicable and legal as well as the one you are installing. But that doesn't mean that they're all compatible with each other. So that has to be checked. Uh, the let's search. So you just search for a 172M and type in the model series text box and it return 248 uh, results. So special attention inspections. 14 CFR 4315 Appendix D and manufacturer's inspections are probably not enough. And 443 is $100 annuals. A detailed inspection or series of inspections, modifications, parts replacements, or a combination of these may be necessary to keep an aging aircraft operating properly. An assessment of an aircraft's paperwork is only the prelude to a thorough aging evaluation. Special inspection criteria can be written to pertain to a specific aircraft or aircraft type. Some aircraft areas are sensitive to calendar age by calendar months or calendar years. Corrosion, wiring, electrical connectors, seals, fuel and hydraulic plumbing, and control cables are examples. Other areas are sensitive to flight hours or corrosion. Examples are major attach fittings such as wings, empennage, and engine attachments. And for instance, the uh, attach bolts are typically never removed and inspected. 
corrosion of salt water and inactivity. So has the aircraft been hangered? How much does it sit outside? If the aircraft spent much of its time outside, there may be or probably will be additional wear on seals, hoses, and moving parts exposed to the extremes of temperature and moisture. The likelihood of corrosion would be higher for an aircraft not hangered. Has the aircraft been around or in salt water? Notice the looks like a 414 sitting in the salt water. I started my FAA career in Orlando and did a lot of inspect ramps, inspections all up and down both coasts and inland. And it doesn't matter if you're inland because the air is still salty because they were fighting corrosion constantly down there. You can take a 30 year old, 40 year old Cessna that spent its life up here and look in the empennage and the aluminum looks new. Not so down there. So has the aircraft been inactive or in storage for an extended period of time? We have roll of type clubs. Type clubs may already have special ins check inspection checklists for your, your aircraft and chances are good that they do and may determine trends specific to demographics such as aircraft location, flight hours, what to expect, I guess, and may provide data regarding field approvals for modification and alterations. Type Club members are encouraged to discuss the concept of additional inspection items with their membership. The Type Clubs already serve an essential role in maintaining the safety of the GA fleet. Developing a special inspection checklist would increase their positive impact on safety. In addition to providing detailed maintenance and inspection data, the checklist enhances the educational aspects of maintaining older aircraft and promotes industry consistency. Contact with the aircraft's type club could be valuable for maintenance and inspection issues. Uh, the AOPA, the AOPA can help you locate an association or type club. Their website has a listing of many known type clubs and you can find them at aopa.org. Baseline checklist here. This, uh, this is an example checklist mentioned in the best practices guide for maintaining aging general aviation aircraft. Uh, this particular one was developed for a special inspection of a wing strut on certain models of a champ. You can develop your specific checklist for your aircraft with the help of this best practices guide for maintaining aging general aviation aircraft. In addition to pointing out specific areas to inspect, the checklist form provides space in columns to document why the inspection may be necessary, if it was due to a service bulletin or other document, when the area or part was last inspected or replaced, and any findings or notes. The last column may aid in documenting special inspections, parts replacements, or other noteworthy actions. The plan, records research development of a special inspection checklist. Inspect the aircraft per the checklist that you developed. Seems logical. Share information with other people that have like aircraft. And the checklist is a living document. Reading and understanding the guide is just the starting point for any owner of an aging small aircraft. You need to use the practices described in this program to increase safety. Like I said, records of research, developing a checklist, and using that checklist. Owners should find that keeping records, research, and documentation of special inspections makes future inspections easier and increases the value of their airplanes. It certainly makes inspections easier in the future. 
and less costly because your technician doesn't have to spend hours researching a logbook, finding out why something should be there or shouldn't be there. Focuses attention on additional inspections, so as being aware of the importance of additional inspections for aging aircraft, help identify document resources, some additional information, provide guidance where additional information can be found, develop your own checklist items. Like we said, aircraft age a lot like us, and age does take its toll. However, if owners take care of their aircraft properly, deal with concerns quickly, and keep up to date on the latest information, their aircraft will remain healthy and safe for a long time. The FAA sets minimum standards for maintenance. Anything more is up to the aircraft owner. This requires, of course, extra expense and effort, but the trade-off is safety and reliability. So if you and your family are up there, you, you want the up in the air, you want the safety and reliability for sure. And we'll leave you with And there you go. I uh, thank you for sitting through this. Hope this hope this helps. I know a lot of the ag airplanes are not brand new, so this may help you guys. And I wish you a productive and safe 2023. Thank you. Um, but with all of that information we shared today, I just want to say on behalf of the Aeronautics Commission, thank you for everything that you do. Aerial application is absolutely critical uh, to uh, our, our economic well-being in North Dakota, our agricultural producers, um, just our, our standard of living overall. You guys play a really incredibly important part in um, what makes North Dakota, North Dakota. And so I want to thank you for everything that you do to keep our economy going, our crops looking great. and. Um, we're always here for you, and so our mission at the Arnox Mission is to continue to encourage and grow aviation, enhance safety throughout the state. So if you have any ideas or things that you'd like to see within the system, uh, please let us know. Something else we'll be talking about at this conference is uh, looking at potential um, opportunities to install FAA weather cameras at different airport sites around the state. And so we're interested in your thoughts on whether that may help uh, the air application community as well. And, and again, we're always open to more ideas or thoughts you may have to improve uh, the system. Uh, that we all operate within. So uh, with that, we thank you for coming and I hope we'll have a successful and safe spring season here in 2023. So thank you.